And Goodall is one of the most influential primatologists in the world. Last year, she celebrated the 40th anniversary of her arrival at Gombe, the preserve in Tanzania, where she first made her groundbreaking discoveries about animal behavior. Through her many books, television specials, and documentaries, she has brought her passion for chimpanzees and nature to audiences all over the world. In a more recent year, she has devoted herself to animal welfare and ecology, traveling 300 days a year to promote her environmental causes. I'm pleased to have her here for the very first time at this table. Welcome. Thank you. You said something important to me in which I was saying that, that I was mourning the death of a friend today. And you said you have a message to as you travel around, and it's about apathy. Tell me what you mean. Well, if we look around at the world today, if we look at the devastation that human beings have wreaked on the environment, if we think about you know, the deforestation, the spread of the desert, the hole in the ozone layer, the changing global climates, if we think about the famine and the poverty and high populations in some areas and high consumptions in others, if we look at the human greed, cruelty, crime and war, we look at a whole global picture that can be very, very depressing, particularly to young people. And I find that so many people today, I think they fall into this trap of thinking, I'm one person in six billion, I know what I should and shouldn't do, but so what, I'm just one. And there are millions of people today thinking, it doesn't really matter what I do, it's all hopeless. So they don't do anything, they fall into apathy. Whereas if we can turn that around, and have millions of people acting the way they know they should, and in particular those of us fortunate enough to be in the wealthier, wealthier strata mm -hmm. of society, this huge power we have when shown collectively because we can afford to make ethical choices in our purchasing. Well said. It seems to me that we, are, we all need, you know, beyond a sense of non-apathy, a real sense of urgency urgency because life is precious yes. uh, across the board, whether it's plant life, or animal life, or whatever it is. I love these two photographs, and I just want to show this book, and then we'll talk about your life and work. This uh, is not as good as the one you like on the back, but just tell me about the photograph for you. Well, that, the hand, is a hand of a chimpanzee who's been imprisoned by himself in a zoo in Congo, Brazzaville and a very magnificent, beautiful, and rather gentle, fully adult male. And he's kind of so desperate for contact, yeah. and he's reaching out and really trying to play with these little wisps of hair caught up in the sunlight. And we were trying to help him and improve his life. Yeah, and this one. Well, that takes me back to the early days at Gombe, those wonderful years of discovery when everything was new. And Flint, who's reaching out to touch my hand, was the first infant whose progress it was possible to study in detail, from birth, really, um, son of that famous old matriarch, Flo. Yeah. And it just brings back such wonderful memories to mind. How long did Flint live? Flint died sadly when he was eight and a half years old, when his old mother died. And although at eight and a half years old, you should be able to survive happily on your own, you don't need a mother. But he was overly dependent on her and it was as though his whole world came to an end and he just stopped eating, didn't want to interact with other chimps and basically died of grief. Mourning for his mother. Mourning for his mother. Wow. What is it about chimpanzees for you? I think it's, you know, they're so like us, which is shown biologically by the close similarity of our genetic mm. structure, you know, differing by only just over 1% in the DNA right. and the similarities in the brain and the blood and all these kind of things, and then uh, in the behavior. And what's so fascinating about the chimpanzees, everyone is unique. Everyone has his or her own unique life history. They can live to be 50, 60 years old, and we never know what we're going to discover next. There's always surprises. After 40 years, there are surprises. And what difference do you hope you have made in the life of chimpanzees? Well, one difference is very clear, that if I hadn't gone to Gombe in 1960, there would be no chimps there at all. 
and outside this tiny little national park, all the trees and the chimps have gone, just like that. And Gombe certainly would not have been saved if there hadn't been somebody there. But I think more than that, it's bringing the chimpanzees into people's lives as individuals, as personalities, as creatures with whom we can relate so, so um, individually. And that in turn has led to a gradual blurring of the line that we used to see as so sharp between us on the one hand and all the other amazing animals on the other. Now that line is very blurry thanks to the chimp. And so it gives us a new respect not only for chimps, but for all these other amazing beings with whom we share or we should share the planet. And what difference have they individually or as a group made in your life? The chimpanzees have taught me humility. They've taught me we're not as different from the rest of the animals as we used to think. They've given me years of intense uh, delight, scientific delight, but more than that, they've, they've being my companions out in the forest, just the chimpanzees and me. And that has opened up a whole new kind of spiritual understanding of nature and what it means to be out there on your own. Do you somehow think this is what you were born to do? I re you know, I really do. And my life seems to have progressed in stages. I mean, how unlikely that uh, a young girl in 1960 with no would, academic training with no academic training would go out I wasn't allowed to be alone so my mother volunteered to come I mean how mad can you get yeah, two, very, two English yeah. ladies a girl yeah. and, a, and a mother yeah. on to on to Kenya uh, going to Kenya and then on to Tanzania yeah. and then you know having these this amazing fortune to discover these incredible things that nobody had been fortunate enough to see before bringing it to the general public, eventually accepted by the scientists with a PhD from Cambridge. Yes. I mean, all of that is so fairy story-like, isn't it? Yes. Now, your mission was what? Well, my mission was simply to, to learn about... To get close and to learn. Yes. That's absolutely it. I didn't want a PhD. Lewis made me do that. Lewis, Lewis Leakey said, you know. Yeah. Now, why? I mean, why? You obviously didn't need a PhD, did you? Yes. Um, did you or did you not? I did not need the PhD <laughs> to do the study. In fact, because I didn't have a university training, right. I hadn't been brainwashed into thinking that animals didn't have personalities, minds, right, or right. feelings. So it's sometimes better if you grew Much up better. outside the circle. Absolutely. But, but what Lewis said to me was, he said, you need a PhD so you can stand on your own two feet and get funding yourself. That and because if, if, if Jane Goodall, PhD, says this, just yes. because they know you've been through the mill. That's it. You've it got gives your you more credibility. That's right? right. And so therefore more people listen to you and if more people listen to you, you'll have more impact. And if you have more impact, after all, that's why you do it in the first place. Well, that's right. And also I can stand up and talk to these scientists in yeah. white coats <laughs> in the medical research labs and yeah. argue with them about the conditions they're keeping their chimpanzees and other animals in. And what did your mother think about all this? Well, she, I mean, she was my great support all through yeah. my childhood. She was the only one who didn't laugh at me when at 11 I dreamed of going to Africa and living with animals and writing books about them. And what did she say? Them. She used to say... Really? No, she just <laughs> used to say, Jane, if you really want something, you work hard, you take advantage of opportunity, and you never give up. You will find a way. So there was never a single moment yeah. that I was told, well, you can't do that because you're a girl which is what everybody outside the family Again, was telling me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, so you had some important lessons there. Absolutely. You know, right away to start to a good life, one you had not been sort of encrusted with, with sort of tradition, and two, you had a great understanding of the self-potential. Yes, I was fortunate enough to have this amazing mother and a very yeah. supportive family, and that was just very, very lucky. Have you passed this on to others? Well, I hope I, I, I get thousands of letters yeah. from children saying, you've taught me that because you did it, I can yeah. do it You're too. You're a role model to many, body, many, many people. I would say probably thousands. Yeah. What do I they know. say when they write you? They, oh, they say things like, you're my hero, I want to be just like you. Um, they tell me about the animal pets that they yeah. have. They tell me their dreams and... You know, and then they say, what shall I do? So I usually write Where do I go? How do I start? Them. Yeah. You know, I, know that. I know those letters. Mm. And what's been the best and worst of it for you? 
Well, as far as my sort of, you know, the career with the chimps and everything goes. I mean your life, not your career. My life. Well, I suppose the worst is when you lose somebody you love. Yeah. And that even includes some of the chimpanzees and definitely some of my dogs. Those feelings of grief and mourning and loss are, are very, the times, you know, they're the hardest, I think. The kidnapping at Gombe when four of my yeah. students were taken, that was another bad time. The best? Mm. Well, there were all those early years of discovery and each one was exciting. And I guess having a baby, that was exciting yeah. too. But it, it was the discovery. I mean, sometimes mm. it is when you, what you did early, when you were so intuitive. Yeah. And so on a voyage of discovery. Yeah. And it was, you yeah. know, the first tool using, the first yeah. tool making. How yeah. was it possible that I'd seen this? Yeah. And then these amazing displays, that, like a dance that they do at the waterfall, which is, is, is so amazing when they sway from foot to foot and the oh, okay. hair is bristling and they push out in the spray and then they're watching the water flow past. I want to skip to the second clip here. This is a clip from Jane Goodall, Reason for Hope, A Spiritual Journey. It's a PBS special, by the way, uh, about her, inspired by a book of the same name. And so as we get this second tape up, I want to take a look at this and we'll uh, get a sense of, of her talking about Africa. Here it is. When Jane Goodall first ventured into the forests of Tanzania 40 years ago, the world knew little about the behavior of chimpanzees in the wild. It was her patient observations of chimps that shed new light on the evolution of man. It's nothingness. It's all. There's nothing in there. She's opened her eyes to a lot of things and made huge discoveries that affected not only the way we look at chimps, but the way we look at ourselves. What is less known about Jane Goodall is that she's also a deeply spiritual person who's thought seriously not only about chimpanzees, but about what it means to be fully human. She over and over again sees evidence that the human spirit is good and it's strong and it's godly uh, and it's moving. She has this message, which everyone can relate to, that we all make a difference in the world, no matter what we do, and it's up to us what kind of difference we make. I just have this absolute belief that humans are moving away from cruelty and destruction towards a time when we can truly live in harmony with nature, when we understand that there is a spiritual power around us from which we can draw strength. Tell me more about the spiritual journey for you that we reflect there, becoming fully human. I think that as we go through life, you know, again, it depends on how we're educated in our youth and I was brought up in a Christian family and so I, I sort of acknowledged always from the beginning without even thinking about it there was a God of some sort yeah. and being out there in the forest eventually brought this sense very close especially if you're out there under the stars at night all by yourself up on a peak and the moonlight shining on the fronds and you feel on the one hand so tiny so so minute and yet, on the other hand, you're amazed because in this tiny little brain of ours, there's all this knowledge. And it, it's, it's very humbling and very awe-inspiring to realize how we can be a tiny little speck. And at the same time, we can encompass the whole of this vastness in a way within a brain that's at least asking questions about it and understanding our relationship to the natural world. What's the principal difference between chimpanzees and humans? I believe the fact that we and only we have developed a sophisticated spoken language and this gives us a totally new ability. We can teach about things that aren't present, we can discuss the past, we can plan for the distant future, we can discuss an idea. You and I, one of us could start with a, a simple idea and as we discuss it so it grows and as we increase the size of the group discussing it the accumulated wisdom of that group will flesh out this idea. And that's something that is very unique to us. It's led on the one hand to human heights of, of communication and compassion and love, and on the other hand, to the human depths of evil and war. Being there, uh, what surprised you about yourself 
What did you discover about yourself? Do you know, I honestly don't think I was surprised by anything. Because I see, I was living a dream, a dream that I had all through my childhood. Yeah. And when I arrived in Africa, I was living in a dream. And I reacted the way I'd always thought that I would. I suppose, I don't know. It, uh, and the rest all came so gradually that I wasn't surprised. Is what you had most of all patience? Yes, patience. Um, and a gift for intimacy. So that. Yeah. Sort of to be to eat their food to clo to be close to them yes to be among them to be among them and to feel them and to sense them and to have intuition and then you p bring in the scientific rigor and you test all these these feelings that you have because they're so like us now how do you test them well you see the same behavior in the same context many times you see the same call eliciting yeah. the same kind of response I'm asking this because I don't know the answer. Uh, when you look at the results of all of your academic, all of your work, what did you tell us about chimpanzees we didn't know? When I first went out in the field, we knew a little bit about captive chimps from some captive studies. We knew nothing about the way they lived in the in wild. wild. Um, we knew nothing about the extent of their similarities to us in the intellectual realm. We, we didn't know very much about their their um, close similarities in the emotional field. And gradually through the years, we find they're more and more and more and more like us. More like us? More like us. In so what we, way? Well, on the one hand, they're capable of extreme brutality. I used to think chimps were like us, but nicer than us. You um, change your mind. And, you know, because there's these long-term affectionate bonds between family members, there's the cooperation between group members, there's the nonverbal communication, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting on the back, same context that we use them, and, and so on and so on. The intellectual abilities like tool using and tool making and so forth. But the, they always seemed nicer. They fought, yes, but it was over very quickly, and then they reassured each other, it's okay, it's finished. But then I discovered there was this brutality, and that's in relation to members of another group. So it's the in-group and the out-group. So was it, was it about turf, or was it about just in and out? Basically, I think it was turf. It was over territory. You enlarge a territory at the expense of a weaker neighbor. Sure. And these these attacks were 20 minute brutal gang attacks and it was shocking and victims died and even females from another group with an infant would be attacked and often the infant killed as well so that was shocking shocking that they showed that dark side but then on the other hand there was all this care and concern for weak members within your own society um, older individuals adopting babies and saving their lives so they're oh, really? showing if, the if love the and the parents were lost somebody would have the older brother or sister usually would take over. Would take over, but once an unrelated adolescent male saved an infant's life. So on the one hand, you got our dark side. On the other hand, side you you got our our good they side. They got both. They've got both. All right, roll tape. Here's a scene of you uh, talking about human behavior. Ever since I was eight, nine years old, and the first pictures of the Holocaust were published in the newspapers, I've had this this real preoccupation with the nature of human evil. When she first began studying chimpanzees, Jane thought they were gentler and more peaceful than humans. But in the 1970s, she and her colleagues witnessed a series of brutal attacks amongst the chimps, which escalated into what became known as the Four-Year War, and more gruesome still, cannibalism. Things began to emerge which showed that chimpanzees were not our innocent selves as we had thought, that in fact they have many, many things in common with what you might call our own darker side. I started thinking about our own aggressive tendencies and how obviously they've been inherited from an ancient primate past. I should say that in Gombe, the, tell me about the terrain. Well, Gombe is, it, the, the terrain is slopes coming down very steeply to Lake Tanganyika. Yeah. 
Which is what we saw. Which is what we saw. And when I arrived in 1960, and even in 1975, you could go for miles along that lake, which is 300 miles long. And you would see forests rolling down to the lake, crystal clear water, few little villages, but basically chimp habitat as far as you could see. Now, the tiny Gombe National Park, which is only 30 square miles, is absolutely surrounded by cultivation. I mean, the trees have gone. And it's not only uh, meaning that the chimps have vanished outside the park, but the people are beginning to suffer. Is this inevitable? No, it's not inevitable. It's happened partly because there's your normal population growth, uh, partly because it's swelled by refugees coming in from Burundi and over the lake from Congo, and partly as a result of very... Uh, the people there have not had the advantage of good education. They haven't had access to good man, uh, land management policies as their land got more and more degraded. So we're working now with 33 villages to improve their lives with tree nurseries, wood, developing woodlots, uh, primary health care, etc. The Jane Goodall Institute. And this is probably the program I'm proudest of. And it is changing lives in 33 villages. We have our conservation education program for children in all these villages, Roots and Shoots, which is now in 50 countries around the world. Wow. So, I mean, this is quite a, quite a ambitious undertaking. It's um, very ambitious, but, you know, once you... Okay, you, you, you're learning about the chimps. You find how amazing they are. You find that in the wild they're disappearing. They're becoming extinct very rapidly. Their forests are going... Uh, they're being hunted for food, they're being hunted for... Is this only in Tanzania? Or is no, this... this is right across Africa. Within 15 years, we could lose all the main chimp populations. Are chimps only found in Africa? Yes, they're only found in Africa. And then their main cause now for, for um, extinction is that people are eating them, along with elephants, gorillas, monkeys, because antelopes, they're pigs. No, Why? because there is a cultural preference among oh. people in Central Africa for the flesh of wild animals, and they don't have a history of domesticating animals. And now that the logging companies have opened the forest with roads, for the first time, the hunters from the cities are going in camping, killing everything. For their family, they find food for their family? No, that, that was the old subsistence hunting. Yeah. You just hunted for your family, for your village, and, and it went fine for hundreds The echo hundreds balance of years. was established. Yeah. The now, ecosystem was in balance. People are coming in from outside. And then there are maybe 3,000 people in the logging camps who weren't there before. And the pygmy hunters, who've had this marvelous harmony with the natural world, are now given ammunition and guns and money to shoot animals for 3,000 people. So what happens when the logging camp goes? The pygmies are left with bare, empty forests. Mm. Take a look at this. This is one more last clip because it, it gives us a chance to see more of Africa. Here it is. What eventually resulted from these low-profile years was a new book, The Chimpanzees of Gombe. This scholarly book, almost 10 years in the making, established Jane Goodall as the world's leading primatologist. She was at the peak of her scientific career, but her decades of quiet research in the forests of Gombe were about to end. It was in 1986 that I went to a conference of chimpanzee experts. We had a session on conservation, which was utterly shocking, I think, to all of us, showing how chimpanzee habitat was being destroyed, chimpanzees were being snared and hunted right across their range and were disappearing at a terrifying rate. We also had a session on use of chimps in medical experimentation which showed images that were utterly haunting of little chimps in cages 22 inches by 22 inches. When I came out of that conference, I realized that I could no longer live in this beautiful forest and stay with these amazing chimpanzee beings while all their relatives were disappearing. It was like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. I I came out of that conference, and from that time on, from October 1986, I haven't spent more than three weeks in one place. Because you're on the road? Because I'm on the road. Promoting, proselytizing, preaching? Whatever you want to call it, I think I have a message which I want to share with people. 
And I've always really wanted to share things with people. You, you know, did, this you little girl who wanted to write books about animals. Yeah. And, and, and what is it you're preaching other than what we've already talked about? Well, basically what we've talked about. It's never about, too late and don't be apathetic. It's never too late that we must have hope. What are my four reasons for hope? The human brain. We put people on the moon, for heaven's right. sake. And we're beginning to understand what we've done to the, to the poor old environment. So can't we get together and live in great harmony? It's happening. Right. Slowly, it's happening. We need to make it happen faster. The resilience of nature, give her a chance. And some give of these devastated chance. areas can yeah, come right. bloom again. That's a great line, give yeah. nature a chance. Give nature a chance. And animals on the brink of extinction can make a comeback. Third, what I call the indomitable human spirit. Yeah. Uh, people who overcome terrible problems and are inspiration, like the man who gave me Mr. H, yeah. who okay. went blind and yet does amazing things with his life. And the man who gave you this does amazing things with his yes, life. Yes, he's blind and yet he climbs Mount Everest mm -hmm. and skydives and talks to when kids. When did he do that? Well, he lost his eyesight at 25, so. Gary Horn, Mr. H. and. Um, He's so good at magic, or he was told he couldn't do it, that the children don't realize he's blind. So then he talks them out, you know, don't give up. If something goes wrong in life, don't give up. Yeah. And anyway, there are all these inspirational people. And then my fourth reason for hope is the energy and commitment of young people, if they know the problems, if they are empowered to act. And that led to the Roots and Shoots program which is taking action in three areas, hands-on, to make your world a better place for animals, people, and the environment that we all share. Are you more passionate now than you were when you were 25? Well, I was probably passionate then about different things, but I suppose then I've always been... Then you're passionate about individual chimps and, and, the, yes. and the community of chimps. Yes. Now you're passionate. How would you define where you are now? Well, I'm, I'm passionate about... Saving the world's about, environment. Yeah, I'm, you know, I have three grandchildren, and when I think about the changes that have happened in the world from the time I was born to how it is for them, I'm deeply shamed. Yeah. And I want to use any little bit of knowledge I've gained, any bit of wisdom I've been able to accumulate. I want to share that with people. I want to go back to chimpanzees. What's the thing you most want to know that you don't know about them? If I could spend half a minute inside a chimpanzee's mind and look out at the world with a chimpanzee's eyes... Oh! What do you think you'd see? Uh, well... I think I'd see a world that's very much like ours, but it's hard, for, at least hard for me, to imagine a world without words. Yeah. It's hard to imagine a world where you have an, a very, a very uh, complex brain, and yet you couldn't communicate in our kind of a way. What would it be like? Yeah. And do you ever wonder if they had a language, what it would do for them, what they could do? Yeah, well, they can be taught. ASL, American Sign Language, right. they can learn 300 signs, computerized language. You've seen a chimp that's, that's learned all those signs? Yes, I've seen and, several. And what do they communicate with those signs, though? Well, they mostly communicate the simple things that you would expect. I'm hungry, I was uh, say, when supper, I'm hungry, when um, supper. come play, yeah. chase, right. hug, right. Right. Um, right. love. Have you hugged a chimp today? Want to go outside and, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. The normal, what you would expect. Where do they sleep? In the wild? Yeah. They climb trees and make nests. And make nests. Yeah, they bend the branches over and it's a nice springy platform. And that keeps them safe from predators. Yes. But you, their it, worst real predator is us. Is humans. Mm. Yeah. You've slept in those you slept in those trees. Well I've I spent one night in a nest. Yeah, and? Well it's comfy, but if it gets windy it's a little, you know <laughs> you need to you tie might. yourself in. <laughs> Yes. One of my students I bet you didn't said sleep he got much. nest sick. I bet you didn't sleep much, huh? No. You are worried about... I didn't spend the whole night there, I don't Oh, think. no, you did? You came down? I think I came down. Well, there wasn't much point. Well, you at least make it through the night. I may have done. I don't, honestly don't remember. <laughs> it was ages ago. What do you miss the most? I miss... I mean, you know, your life is t you've turned into this sort of yeah, I know. icon. That's what you are, an icon. What I miss is the time to be alone in the forest or in nature anywhere and yeah. I miss very much having not enough time for writing. Yeah. Oh, you, well, why don't you have time for writing? Because I'm always on the road. Oh, you're 10 days here and 10 days there yes, on, on the road promoting to, to this car. And you do yeah. it because it's sort of like it's been cast on you because it, of yeah. your fame and because of your reach and because people want to hear you. 
And because I do care about children, and I do care about animals, and I do want to change attitudes, and I want all the children helping. So we got this great festival in New York at the American Museum of Natural History this Saturday. Right from 10 to 4, and that's going to be children from all the several surrounding states coming to show what they've done. Would well, do you want more children there? I want lots of children. All there. right, children, you heard that. If, if you're up late tonight, Saturday at the American Museum of Natural History, you can go and do this, and you can go, go to the planetarium. You can have a fine day. They'll have a wonderful day, and they can meet Mr. H. Well, how, about, how about Miss Jane? Can they <laughs> You'll be there. Can I meet? Oh, will you Dr. Be there? Jane will be there. Dr. Absolutely. Jane will be there? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> I can't miss these children events. <laughs> they keep me going. I mean, their, ch their eyes start shining. And this is yeah. what we've done. We are changing the world. Yes, they yeah. are. I, I, I believe you. What's your greatest regret of your life? Oh, well, I'm, I'm really sad that my first marriage didn't work out. And I think particularly, you know, for my son's sake, yeah. that was, that's, that's a shame. And I suppose I could have worked harder at it or Hugo could or something. But, you know, that's one of those things. That's a, that's a sadness. Yeah. Um, just didn't, did he, did he take this picture? Yes, he did. We're still very good friends. In yeah. fact, he's back living. We're all in the same compound in, in Tanzania again. He's with right? my grandchildren now. Oh, so he's, he's with the grandchildren yeah. while you're here. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Do you consider Tanzania home? It's one of my two homes. Gombe is my spiritual home. My other home is England, the house where I grew up. Yeah, when you went to Cambridge to school. You got your yeah. PhD from Cambridge, did you or not? Yes, yes. Yeah. So what's the biggest misconception about you, you think? Oh, I think a lot of people think I'm kind of very frail and prim and proper and, you know. <laughs> well, you do fact. look like that a bit, but, but you have well, this gleam in your eye, yes, too. Yes, of great. course. Well, yeah. you have to have a great sense of humor. You yeah. have to be prepared to be quite sick. That's why I like taking Mr. H around, because it's quite ridiculous. <laughs> you know, he's been now to 41 countries yeah. in five years, and it's ridiculous. It makes people smile, and oh. we don't smile enough. Yeah. You know, how many people can we make smile in a day? I don't know. I'd make, I, yeah, I don't know. I hope more than, uh, probably more, we could do a lot more than we accomplish. Yeah, we pass we on smiles. The potential. We and he makes cause, people smile. He makes people smile. When you touch yeah. him and you get the inspiration from his giver. So. You used to eat a lot of bananas, didn't you? Quite a few. Yeah, because they ate bananas, you ate bananas. Well, they were just there and they were a cheap food. We never yeah. had very much money. Well, our institute still doesn't have very much money. So you need money for the institute too? Oh, yes. I need to create an endowment <laughs> and, you yeah. know, lecture, lecture after lecture. And I want everybody listening to become members of our institute. Yeah. We okay, have a website, janegoodall.org. Oh my gosh, she has a website. janegoodall.org. Please be a member. Yeah. I'm asking you How? too. All right. Now, how many chimpanzees are there in the world? There's probably 150 to 200,000. There used to be 2 million. Oh, so what can we do about that? Well, but, I mean, the we problem is that they, their natural habitat's been destroyed. Yes, what we have to do is save what's left. Right. And this is a very, very tough problem. It's not easy. However, we can help look after individual orphans, which we're doing in right. Africa. And this is Adopt working. Adopt a chimp. Yeah, but it's working magically because our people who take Africans around the sanctuary to see these young chimps who normally eat chimps, several times have said, I can never eat another chimpanzee. They are too like us. So they're paying for their keep, these young ambassadors. It's a great pleasure to have you here. You're doing great, wonderful work. I mean, what do you think of cloning chimpanzees? I don't want to clone chimpanzees any more than I want to clone humans. <laughs> Do you want to clone humans? <laughs> well, with one exception. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I'm honored to meet you and have you on this program. Well, it's great to meet you too, again. Mm. I should go to Tanzania. Can I see you if I go to Tanzania? Probably not. I expect I'll be in Moscow or Japan or But I can something. see Hugh, though. You can see Hugh, And Hugo. I can see the grandchildren. You can go and see Fifi. Is Fifi's the there? Fifi is there. <laughs> How you old is Fifi, Fifi by now? 42. 42? Mm -hmm. She was an infant when I arrived How with mum. How come Mom. Fifi lives so long? She's just from a very dominating family. <laughs> She's got many kids. <laughs> yes. She's amazing. Oh, my God. Yes. And 42. I look into her eyes, and I know there are certain memories that only she and I have going back to those early really? 60s. Yes. You think Fifi knows that? Yes. Fifi looks at you and says, 
Jane and I, we've got memories. No, she doesn't say that, but I know that in her head are stored some of these memories, you know, when Mike was kicking his uh, cans around. Yeah, and good for you, Jane. It, it is. Jane Goodall, 40 years at Gombe, a tribute to four decades of wildlife research, education, and conservation. Goodall Institute, uh, the American Museum of Natural History, come on Saturday. Uh, she'll be there. Dr. Jane will be there. Uh, children from all over should come. Yeah, and we've got something at the New School University on Sunday at 3 o'clock to anything to else concert. we want Anything else we want to promote, Jane? That's it. We've promoted everything. Thank <laughs> you, got your Charlie. List <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Jane Goodall, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Jane Goodall is one of the most influential primatologists in the world. Last year, she celebrated the 40th anniversary of her arrival at Gombe, the preserve in Tanzania, where she first made her groundbreaking discoveries about animal behavior. Through her many books, television specials, and documentaries, she has brought her passion for chimpanzees and nature to audiences all over the world. In a more recent year, she has devoted herself to animal welfare and ecology, traveling 300 days a year to promote her environmental causes. I'm pleased to have her here for the very first time at this table. Welcome. Thank you. You said something important to me in which I was saying that, that I was mourning the death of a friend today. And you said you have a message to as you travel around, and it's about apathy. Tell me what you mean. Well, if we look around at the world today, if we look at the devastation that human beings have wreaked on the environment, if we think about you know the deforestation, the spread of the desert, the hole in the ozone layer, the changing global climates, if we think about the famine and the poverty and high populations in some areas and high consumptions in others. If we look at the human greed, cruelty, crime and war, we look at a whole global picture that can be very other amazing beings with whom we share or we should share the planet. And what difference have they individually or as a group made in your life? The chimpanzees have taught me humility. They've taught me we're not as different from the rest of the animals as we used to think. They've given me years of intense uh, delight, scientific delight, but more than that, they've, they've been my companions out in the forest, just the chimpanzees and me. And that has opened up a whole new kind of spiritual understanding of nature and what it means to be out there on your own. Do you somehow think this is what you were born to do? I re you know, I really do. And my life seems to have progressed in stages. I mean, how unlikely that uh, a young girl in 1960... With no would, academic training. With no academic training would go out. I wasn't allowed to be alone, so my mother volunteered to come. I mean, how mad can you get? Yeah, two, very. two English yeah. ladies, a girl yeah. and, a, and a mother. Yeah. On, to, on to Kenya. Uh, going to Kenya and then on to Tanzania. Yeah. And then, you know, having these this amazing fortune to discover these incredible things that nobody had been fortunate enough to see before, bringing it to the general public, eventually accepted by the 1% in the DNA right. and the similarities in the brain and the blood and all these kind of things, and then uh, in the behavior. And what's so fascinating about the chimpanzees, everyone is unique. Everyone has his or her own unique life history. They can live to be 50, 60 years old, and we never know what we're going to discover next. There's always surprises. After 40 years, there are surprises. And what difference do you hope you have made in the life of chimpanzees? Well, one difference is very clear, that if I hadn't gone to Gombe in 1960, there would be no chimps there at all. And outside this tiny little national park, all the trees and the chimps have gone just like that. And Gombe certainly would not have been saved if there hadn't been somebody there. But I think more than that, it's bringing the chimpanzees into people's lives as individuals, as personalities, as creatures with whom we can relate so, so um, individually. And that in turn has led to a gradual blurring of the line that we used to see as so sharp between us on the one hand and all the other amazing animals on the other. Now that line is very blurry thanks to the chimp. And so it gives us a new respect 
not only for chimps, but for all these very, very depressing, particularly to young people. And I find that so many people today, I think they fall into this trap of thinking, I'm one person in six billion, I know what I should and shouldn't do, but so what, I'm just one. And there are millions of people today thinking, it doesn't really matter what I do, it's all hopeless. So they don't do anything, they fall into apathy. Whereas if we can turn that around and have millions of people acting the way they know they should, and in particular those of us fortunate enough to be in the wealthier, wealthier strata mm -hmm. of society, this huge power we have when shown collectively because we can afford to make ethical choices in our purchasing. Well said. It seems to me that we, are, we all need, you know, beyond a sense of not apathy, a real sense of urgency. Urgency because life is precious yes. uh, across the board, whether it's plant life, animal life, or whatever it is. I love these two photographs, and I just want to show this book, and then we'll talk about your life and work. This uh, is not as good as the one you like on the back, but just tell me about the photograph for you. Well, that, the hand is a hand of a chimpanzee who's been imprisoned by himself in a zoo in Congo, Brazzaville. And a very magnificent, beautiful, and rather gentle, fully adult male. And he's kind of so desperate for contact. Yeah. And he's reaching out and really trying to play with these little wisps of hair caught up in the sunlight. And we were trying to help him and improve his life. Yeah, and this one. Well, that takes me back to the early days at Gombe, those wonderful years of discovery when everything was new. And Flint, who's reaching out to touch my hand, was the first infant whose progress it was possible to study in detail, from birth, really, um, son of that famous old matriarch, Flo. Yeah. And it just brings back such wonderful memories to mind. How long did Flint live? Flint died sadly when he was eight and a half years old, when his old mother died. And although at eight and a half years old, you should be able to survive happily on your own, you don't need a mother. But he was overly dependent on her and it was as though his whole world came to an end and he just stopped eating, didn't want to interact with other chimps and basically died of grief. Mourning for his mother. Mourning for his mother. Wow. What is it about chimpanzees for you? I think it's, you know, they're so like us, which is shown biologically by the close similarity of our genetic mm. structure, you know, differing by only just over.